So joining us now is Professor Joshua A. Douglas from University of Kentucky at Rosenberg College of Law. Thank you so much for joining us here, Professor. Thanks so much for having me. We really appreciate you being here. So you have written a book called Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. Also, I know you study the field of voting rights, election law, as well as many other things. But first, maybe start off by telling us a little bit about your book, uh, the topics you cover, and how you feel it pertains to the upcoming election and really our election systems in general. Sure. So, you know, most of what we hear about when people talk about the right to vote is doom and gloom, right? There's this sense that it's becoming harder to participate in our democracy, especially for uh, certain kinds of people, certain demographic groups. Uh, There's this feeling that the system is rigged. And, you know, you hear that from both sides, from both the left and the right for different reasons. Um, And yet what I learned through a lot of my research is that there's a lot of good news on the ground in communities all over the country where people are trying to make our system more inclusive, more democratic, to break down barriers, to make it more convenient to vote. And so my book tells the stories of these everyday Americans. I call them democracy heroes or democracy champions that are working to bring more people into the political process, to break down barriers to participation and make it easier to vote. And these are some amazing individuals that I profile. And through their stories, I try to make the case for various uh, reforms to our election system, various things that states and localities are already doing in how we run our elections to get as high turnout as possible. You know, I end the book with the, this notion of 90% turnout. You know, typically in a presidential election, we have 60% turnout nationwide. In a midterm, a congressional election, it's much lower. In 2018, we had 50% turnout and people were celebrating. That was amazing. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> Half the people didn't show up. How is this amazing? I mean, it's, it's good historically. Uh, we can do a lot better. And so the book is really a call to action to all of us to, uh, to, to you know, go into our communities, to dive in and to make this thing so much better. And I think doing so can, can really change the scope of our democracy. Wow. Yeah. So uh, can you explain for people who don't know uh, what voter suppression is and like possibly how that is carried out, how it's executed? You know, I think a good definition is simply any policy or mechanism or practice that makes it harder for people to vote. And typically what we see is that these sorts of things like strict photo ID requirements for voting or purges of the voter registration rolls, uh, proof of citizenship requirements to register. Some states tried to pass a law that you had to provide a documentary proof of your citizenship. Uh, in order to register. Historically, we had things like the poll tax or literacy tests, or uh, you can't register to vote unless you can tell me how many bubbles are in a bar of soap or how many beans are in a can. Obviously, they have a a racial uh, impact and and was the real force behind them historically. I think there are also lingering racial effects on many of these activities. And, you know, the nefarious kind, the the kind of voter suppression that we think of is kind of evil is where you're doing so to try to cut out a certain segment of society, whether it's racial minorities, whether it's one political party. Uh, And unfortunately, ours is a history of voter suppression. Um, And, you know, so what I try to do in my book is I try to contrast that with, you know, we have this voter suppression. At the same time, there are there are mechanisms to push back against that. And, you know, ours is a a history, I think, of ever expanded voter access. You know, if you think about our founding, the first uh, elections were only white male property owners that can vote. And, you know, now 100 years, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. So obviously our elections are better now than they were then, but they're still not perfect. And, And, you know, modern day voter suppression tactics I think are one reason for that. So, I mean, do you think that we're starting to head in a more positive direction, even with, you know, everything you hear in the news and the media going on right now? Like today, do you feel like there is still an active element out there trying to cause and create voter suppression? Or is it the opposite where things are starting to open up and get better? Or is it a mix of both? 
I think it's a dual story. I think there's only almost two tracks. And in fact, sadly, I think you almost see uh, two Americas in terms of their voting policies with one set of states that have certain policies that are much more inclusive and make it easier to participate and another set of states that make it harder to vote and, and have a lot of voter restrictions. And it's not going to surprise you, unfortunately, that that tracks partisan lines as well, uh, where one party is as seen right now is trying to make it easier to vote and the other party is, is seen as trying to make it harder to vote because of the effects, that I think, that those political parties feel like they'll have on their ability to win on the outcomes. So it's really a dual track. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated story. You have these you know, voter suppression tactics like voter purges of the registration rolls, like photo ID requirements. But at the same time, you have what I call pro-voter policies, like easing registration rules, allowing people to, to register on, on election day and vote, no, no requirement that you register ahead of time. Or before the pandemic, we had states moving towards universal vote by mail, where everyone was automatically sent a ballot. Uh, and I think, you know, that's actually happening in both so-called red and so-called blue states, but it's a great example of a, of a pro-voter policy. Yeah. And I guess that's, it's really interesting because it, those two different sides that are both making progress further solidify the red and the blue states in a way, but it's like a lot of those red states might be more blue if, you know, there wasn't so much voter suppression in the cities and in the urban areas, because that's where the the highest uh you know concentration of people are so you know i suppose that's why it's important that you know to pay attention to each state when you whatever state you live in what the policies are on that stuff and and help and that's why i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know some organizations that are out there that do help let's say in low-income neighborhoods where that are hurt the most by voter suppression voter id for instance helping people get state issued ids um and helping you know people get to the polls in one way or another helping to open more polling locations are there some organizations that it's good to point to for that or, i mean i'm sure there's many so it's hard to pinpoint but yeah and and let me uh, emphasize that you know when i talk about the red and the blue differences in in terms of how we vote um that's not universal which is to say that there are some voter policies that are being passed in both red and blue places around the country and so what I think, you know, in this super polarized time period, we actually need to focus on the kinds of policies that are receiving widespread support, like universal vote by mail, like same day voter registration, and like getting IDs into people's hands if we're going to have a photo ID requirement like you just mentioned. And so the groups that I point to are all nonpartisan. They're just all about getting people to vote. So one excellent organization is called Vote Riders. Um, this is a group that goes into states and communities and, and, as you mentioned, cities, and just helps people obtain the IDs that they need, which, you know, that helps them not only for voting, but in their everyday lives. Because, you know, although voter ID laws are a form of voter suppression because they tend to target the people who don't have an ID and the people who don't have, tend to have an ID are poor, racial minorities, students, elderly uh, and, and so, you know, it, it has a disproportionate impact on certain communities. But what a group like Vote Riders does is goes into those communities and help people, for example, obtain their birth certificate that they might need to get an ID. Um, another similar group is called Spread the Vote. Uh, Spread the Vote focuses really on students and minority communities in particular. Uh, I profile both of those organizations in my book. As you said, there's tons of organizations. And in fact, the appendix to my book has a list of all 50 states and about three or four organizations in each one that are working on issues of democracy reform. So my hope is that someone reads the book, feels inspired that they too can make a difference, flips to the back to find their state and contacts one of the organizations that's listed for their state. Very cool. So um, I have a couple of like a three part question kind of. Um, how long has voting by mail been around? Um, how many votes each year typically, not in a pandemic obviously, uh, come in by mail slash absentee? And also, is it true that mail slash absentee uh, ballots are the same in all but five states? Okay, so three-part question there in terms of first, how long have we been voting by mail? You know, all states had some kind of vote by mail since the Civil War, and that's absentee balloting. Wow. Because 
And it was really um, Abraham Lincoln who wanted to continue being able to uh, fight in the war in 1864 uh, and yet had all these troops scattered about, um, uh, you know, fighting against the Confederacy. And so states came up with absentee balloting procedures so these soldiers didn't have to come home to vote, uh, in part so he can get reelected. Uh, so states have had absentee balloting for decades. Um, many states put it in their state constitution, that a requirement that absentee balloting is available. Now, in terms of the differences between absentee balloting and vote by mail and universal vote by mail, these are all terms that are thrown around a lot. Um, so five states, as you mentioned, automatically mail a ballot to every registered voter in the state. Those are Washington, Oregon, um, Colorado, Utah, and California. Almost all of California used to, and now this year California will be an entirely vote by mail state. We also have states like Arizona, which about 75% of the vote in Arizona is by mail. Um, Minnesota, I think, is uh, pretty high. I think it's over 50%. Um, these states that have you know, what's called no excuse absentee balloting, that is, you don't need to provide an excuse, you can just request your ballot. You know, you're not automatically receiving it without doing anything, but the voters themselves like the, the process so much that right. so many voters go ahead and do it, again, even before the pandemic. So the question of, you know, how is it different between the states? You know, there's universal vote by mail, which I refer to as the states that automatically send you a ballot. And again, there's five of those. And I think there's five more that are going to do it for this year as, as kind of a one-time deal. But I suspect they're going to see the success of that and, and they may continue it. Um, and then there's the other states where you uh, anyone can get an absentee ballot, but you have to request it. And then there's the final set of states where you need an excuse still to vote absentee. Right now, as of the as the time of that we're chatting, six states for the 2020 election are still requiring an excuse and COVID-19 doesn't count. Concerns about COVID-19 don't count in six you states. Know what so, states those are? so it's Texas is one of the big offenders, Tennessee, Indiana, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Mississippi are the are the, the evil six. Uh, perhaps we can call them because uh, they're the ones that I think are still making it too hard to vote. That said, even those states, there's litigation going on right now. Um, there's lawsuits in those states and there's legislation being proposed. South Carolina might come off the list because one house of their state legislature has passed a rule to let anyone vote by mail if they just cite a coronavirus concern. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, the time is running short. But uh, right now, as of, as of our taping of this, it's uh, it's uh, six states. Yeah, I mean, I, I live in Texas and I actually looked into this and that is what I found out. I was like, oh, no, like I absolutely have to go, you know, and uh, and I made the commitment, obviously, like I'm going to get up. I'm going to stand in line no matter how long it takes to make sure that my vote is counted. So I have a question, um, I you know. It's that people are starting to get a little bit nervous about their mail-in ballots. And like, we're seeing articles come out now that your votes won't be counted, you know, for a few days after election night. So on election night this year, we're not going to know who the president of the United States technically is. And, you know, I, I, it, it gives people a lot of anxiety on whether they should, you know, take that risk or, you know, just show up at the polls. And, you know, back in the day, we had that situation where, you know, a lot of uh, votes were contested uh, with George Bush and there you had the hanging chat. And now I hear that there's five different ways your mail-in ballot could be, you know, thrown out if your signature doesn't match, you know, it, how, how do, what would you say to people who are a little bit anxious about that situation? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things to discuss there. So, you know, one, we do know that the rate of ballot rejection is higher with absentee or mail-in ballots than it is with in-person votes. So, you know, if you're able to vote in person, uh, you know, especially if there's an early voting period where you can show up in person early voting, if that's a concern of yours, it's not a bad thing to do that. Uh, there's all been a lot of conversation about the U.S. Postal Service and the delivery of ballots. Um, I think that, you know, especially as we get closer and closer to November 3rd, it's maybe a better bet to deliver your ballot through a drop box. And virtually every state has secure drop boxes um, to take ballots. So if you don't feel like you want to trust the Postal Service, maybe it makes more sense to, to hand deliver your ballot through the drop box. But to your broader question about, you know, election night, we're used to staying up late. 
And, you know, eventually the networks make a call as to who the next president of the United States will be. I think it's very unlikely we're going to see that this year. And here's why. So many of our ballots across lots of states, including the so-called swing states, are going to be by, by mail. And those ballots can't be counted until November 3rd, until uh, what we traditionally consider Election Day. Some of the states can process, start processing them, right, to, you know, make sure signatures match and whatnot. But actually, the counting can't happen until November 3rd. So we may know a count of based on who showed up in person and, you know, whose ballots have been delivered already in some of the states. But that will be very incomplete. The other thing we know about mail-in ballots is that for whatever reason, Democrats tend to vote by mail more and tend to deliver their ballots later in the election season. And so this is referred to as well documented as the big blue shift. That is, as the counts go on after election day, as more and more ballots come in after election day and they're counted and these are perfectly valid, Democrats tend to do better. We saw this in 2018, actually, where the media didn't recognize kind of a big wave in the congressional elections on election night. But as the ballots were counted in places like Arizona uh, and other places, California, that have a lot of mail-in ballots, Democrats started doing a lot better. And so I think we can expect the vote totals to shift from November 3rd uh, in the next several days after that. And that's perfectly normal. That's just the ballots being counted. Um, and, you know, just the phenomenon of Democratic leaning ballots tend to come in later. There's something fraudulent about that. Um, and, you know, to dispel one other myth, lots of people I hear say, well, I've heard that absentee ballots don't count unless it makes a difference in the outcome. That is absolutely not true. Every single absentee ballot counts. Um, the election is not final until it's certified by the, by the election officials. What we hear on election night is just the media doing the media's thing and nothing else besides that. We should be bracing for a almost month long time after election night of not knowing who the president is. Well, I don't think it'll be a month is my guess, because although that's the deadline, states will finish well before that. Right. So, you know, I think within a, maybe a week or so, we'll have a good sense of uh, who the next president is. And, you know, obviously we'll come down to some of the key states like, Wisconsin and Michigan and uh, Pennsylvania and Florida, mm -hmm. uh, some of those, those swing states, and, and how long did they take for their ballot counting? Well, with the current president talking about, you know, voter fraud and in mail-in, you know, um, voting, I just had a few questions on that. And, you know, A, how prevalent is voter fraud? And with the current president also telling people, whether in jest or in seriousness, to go put in a mail-in vote, and then also vote in person, what's the likelihood of that being caught by election officials? Like how, you know, how good is the structure to be able to count, you know, to be able to see if that has happened and to discard those votes? And are those people who do that, A, breaking the law, B, are there both their votes not counted and see what, you know, what, What's the penalty for that? Yeah, so let me take your first question on voter, uh, voter fraud first. I mean, how much voter fraud is there? The answer is very little. Um, you know, so we talk about voter fraud in different kinds of ways, the kind of voter fraud that exists. So let's talk about photo ID requirements. Photo ID laws only root out one kind of fraud. That's in-person impersonation. Someone showing up to the polls, pretending to be someone they're not. That happens almost never. One study of uh, over a dozen years looked at every, basically every election during those dozen years, so over 1 billion ballots cast, and found only 31 possible instances of voter fraud. Uh, and then when looking at diving into those 31, about half of them were things like the, you know, the a father and a son with the same name and the junior showing up and getting checked in under the senior's uh, name with the poll book. So, you know, voter fraud, that it just does not happen. So the specific question about double voting, right, sending in your mail-in ballot and then showing up to the polls. First, election officials have a mechanism to track that because when they send your absentee ballot out, it's tracked and there's a record in it with your name. So when you show up to the polls, they're going to say, hey, hold up, you've requested an absentee ballot. Yeah. Now, if you say, you know, you say, well, I never received it, you're going to have to cast what's called the provisional ballot, which is basically the same ballot, but it's set aside. And then we figure out after election day whether it should count or not. Um, if you have submitted your absentee ballot, the election officials are going to say your absentee ballot's been received. And if you try to vote 
here in person on the machine, you're committing a felony, a double voting. Uh, every state and federal law makes it a crime to vote twice. So the system is set up to catch this. Now, I think election officials are going to be completely overwhelmed if you have thousands upon thousands of people doing what the president suggested. So it's, it's dangerous for the election system and they're committing a felony uh, if they do it. But there are mechanisms based on ballot tracking to root out the, this when it might occur on occasion. Yeah, and I think he, I mean, perhaps part of the, you know, we're trying not to be too uh, partisan here, but I think a lot of the reason that he may have suggested that is because voter fraud is so rare. He wants to show up, well, this year with this mail-in, there was so much fraud. You had people doing this and that. Everyone will forget by that time that he's actually the one who suggested it. And so he could be trying to create some unrest or some confusion in that way. So I'm glad that we're, that we're clarifying that. Um, Yeah. And, you know, this is not a partisan statement for me to say that it's very dangerous for the president of the United States to be undermining the the democratic norms that we uh, that we have used for years to be undermining the hard work of local election officials um, and and planting these ideas, which is going to overwhelm the system. If we have a free and fair democracy, we should let everyone vote and let the chips fall as they may. And unfortunately, throughout the year, he's been undermining the legitimacy of the election process, presumably in case he loses, then he can have something to latch on to to potentially contest the results. Um, but, you know, it's really dangerous for democracy. And again, that's not a partisan statement. It's a factual statement. I would say that about, about any candidate who is yeah. making these kinds of, of wild accusations without any facts whatsoever. Well, this has been a lot of really, really good information. Can't thank yes. you enough for being here, yeah. Professor. My pleasure. It's great to have you all doing this and, you know, reaching out to to your fans and making sure because, you know, our democracy is only as strong as everyone who participates in it. Our Declaration of of Independence says that democracy is legitimate based on the consent of the governed. Shouldn't the governed uh, include all of us? And that's really what I'm all about is finding ways to make sure I don't care who you vote for. I don't care which side wins. You know, of course, I have my personal preferences, but as a a scholar of democracy. I care about democracy flourishing through everybody participating. And that's really what this is all about. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. And your Thank book you. highlights that well. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>